We left off last week. If you remember in Mark chapter 3, you had the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders of the time, had rejected Jesus and the people as well. And so starting in chapter 4 of Mark, Jesus began focusing on building up the little flock, those the believing remnant of Israel, to so that they can get through the kingdom, uh, not through the king, get through the tribulation period and enter into God's kingdom. And so we're picking up in Mark chapter six, and in this chapter we're going to see that Jesus is going to call his twelve apostles to continue his ministry. But we're going to see that they lack faith in Jesus' teachings, and so does Israel as a whole. Because Israel is coming to him for physical healings, but not for spiritual healing. So there in chapter 6, in the first six verses, you have Jesus um, coming to... Um, let's see here. He is... He, yeah, he comes to his own city there. Verse 1 in chapter 6 of book Mark says, He went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. And so then he goes in the Sabbath day, verse 2, When the Sabbath day was coming, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? So they see that this guy is speaking. The, they're used to going to the synagogue and hearing what they think is God's word. But the fact that he teaches and they hear really the authority behind what he's teaching, this shows that what the Jewish religious leaders were doing is they weren't preaching the word of God, they were teaching man's traditions. And, and so as Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, the word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive and powerful. And so when Jesus speaks God's word, God's law, then they are amazed at that because they're not used to hearing that. They're used to the Jewish religious leaders teaching their traditions. But then they reject him even though they see the mighty works and they see his you know, they see the mighty works, they, they see his authority, the God's word is being taught, because they recognize him. In verse 3 it says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So because they knew him as sort of the hometown boy that grew up there, they think, well, this can't be the Messiah. This guy can't, you know, be who he claims to be, the son of God, because we already know him. We know he's the son of Mary. And also this verse here, in verse 3, tells you that Mary did not remain a virgin for her life, as the Catholics teach, but that she had other children. She had at least six other children beside Jesus, which would have been all of these by natural means, uh, with Joseph being the father, as he had four brothers at least, and uh, at least two sisters. So he really, uh, he was rejected in that in his own country there in Nazareth. And so you see there in verse 6, it says, He marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. So then he goes to the other um, cities round about. And if, if you look at the parallel passage over in Matthew chapter 9, we get a little bit of insight as to what's going on. Because it says there in verse 35 of Matthew chapter 9, it says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So he had been doing this, but then he sees in verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So when he came to Nazareth, he taught not as the Jewish religi religious leaders taught, but he taught God's word. And that's the pattern that he sees as he goes through all these cities. He sees Israel not following God's word, but rather they're steeped in the religion of the Father. Tradition of the Fathers is what the Jewish religious leaders are teaching. Therefore, Jesus then calls unto him uh, so 12 apostles who will begin expanding the ministry, basically, because since Jesus is the only one, pretty much, teaching, only, teaching God's word in the synagogues, well, now he's going to call at least 12 others to do so. They're going to take over from the Jewish religious leaders. Now, officially, they, the Jewish religious leaders will remain in power through the Antichrist kingdom through the end of the tribulation period. But uh, he calls them at least to begin a ministry uh, because once uh, Israel will have another chance to accept, to, to, ex to, to follow God's law and to have faith in God, what God has told them to do and, and to believe. And so that will be with the Holy Ghost coming in Acts chapter 2. And so these 
are the 12 here are going to lead Israel into that, give them another chance to, uh, to accept the kingdom, which was at hand at the time, and enter into the kingdom, have the tribulation period start right after if Israel was willing to become a kingdom of priests, and that opportunity will come with the coming of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. They do not take that opportunity, and so they ended up going, the dispensation of grace starts, as we know, in Acts chapter 9 with Paul. And there, the Israel's kingdom program has been put on hold. But you notice there, Mark chapter 6, verse 7, says, He called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but we be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, and what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So Jesus sends them out to do the two signs of the kingdom. They are going to, they have power over unclean spirits so they can cast out devils and they can also heal the sick. You see that in verse uh, 13, it says, They cast out many devils, and anointed with oil many that were sick, and healed them. And they also preached the gospel of the kingdom. That's seen in verse 12. It says, They went out and preached that men should repent. Remember, John the Baptist and Jesus both preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And to demonstrate that, yes, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the two telltale -tell -tell signs of the kingdom which is to cast out devils and to heal the sick. So the disciples, basically the twelve apostles here, are an extension of Jesus' ministry, and he sends them out to go to these cities. And then if so, in verse 13, we read how they, verse 12, they preached that men should repent. Verse 13, they cast out many devils, and they healed the sick and anointed the sick and healed them. And then down in verse 30, it says, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. So they basically, Jesus sends them out there. They go out in verse 12 and 13, and then verse 30 we're told uh, that they basically give a report back to Jesus. Now in the middle there, you have sort of a parenthetical reference here, verses 14 through 29, where it covers the death of John the Baptist. And you might think, well, why is this here? We've been told about John the Baptist ministry, and that he was the forerunner of Jesus. He was that messenger sent to prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight, as Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 says. He came in the power and spirit of Elijah, as Luke chapter 1, verse 17 says. And so he came, and then as John chapter... And so then, when, um, when it was time, he did that for about six months, preaching in the wilderness and near Jordan, uh, baptizing people. People came to them confessing their sins. They were, he was building up that kingdom of priests for those who believe the gospel of the kingdom. And then they were baptized with water to be cleansed from their idolatry. And so that was his ministry. He did this for about six months. And then the Pharisees, or I should, should say that Herod, and um, had him arrested and was put into prison. And that's when Jesus began his ministry in Galilee and started his three, three and a half year ministry before his crucifixion. And as John the Baptist had said before that happened, he says in John chapter 3, he says, I must decrease, but he must increase. And so then John just sort of falls off the scene there. He's put in prison and then everything, there's this focus on Jesus' ministry from here on out. With the exception of this story that's inserted here about the death of John the Baptist. And it sort of seems out of place because... Um, he's going back in time here. We're telling of something that's happened in the past. So, um, no, number one, the Gospels really are not just a historical account of what happened to Jesus. As we've demonstrated, the miracles that are given are specifically told to demonstrate, to teach things to the little flock, to Israel as a whole, and to prepare them with the mysteries of the kingdom, prepare them to go through the tribulation period. Uh, the stories in the Gospels also tell you about how Israel has rejected their Messiah and their reaction where they follow the physical healings but not the spiritual healings. And so it's kind of weird that this story of John the Baptist's death is inserted here. Um, and, but the reason I think we have this, and you know why at this point, I think is to demonstrate, you've probably heard the saying that uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely and power brings corruption. 
I mean, that, that's not a quote of the Bible, that's just a saying. It is, it is pretty true that the pride of man gets involved when man gets power, and instead of doing, especially since it's not all about pride, Jesus will say later to his disciples, and we'll see it later, that he says that if you want to be first, you must deny yourself and become a servant in order to be great in the kingdom. So if you've got a lot of power, it's easy to get prideful and think of yourself as a master and not as a servant. And then you would, they would no longer be doing the work of God. So when the disciples are given the ability to heal the sick and uh, cast out devils, uh, you know, they could, that power could go to their heads. And so we're told, basically, and I believe the reason that John the Baptist's death is inserted here is in between the time that the twelve are given the power and they go out and cast out devils and heal the sick to the time that they report these things back to Jesus. We're told this in the middle here about John the Baptist. I believe it's here to tell us about how, you know, to, to warn the disciples about how they need to um, continue to trust in God's word and rely on God and not think that the power is of themselves, that they're doing it of themselves, that they are great in themselves, but it is all of God. And and to see that the reaction of the people who see God's power is to think that they are like God, or they are God. And that's what we see with King Herod. Because if you look in verse 14 there, it says, And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. So that's Jesus. He heard of Jesus. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. So basically, he thinks that John the Baptist is like God, basically, uh, because you see in verse 16, it says, But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. So he thinks that John the Baptist is sort of being God or like God, and that he is able to rise from the dead. And that's who he thinks Jesus is, then, is John the Baptist risen from the dead. And you notice how Herod treated John. Uh, when he was put, when Herod had taken him and cast him in prison before he beheaded him, um, he didn't want to behead him because he feared him. It was basically his. Uh, it was Herodias. Herodias was the Herod had. Uh, we're told here that Herod took his brother Philip's wife and married her. So since she married Herod, she's Herodias now. And Herodias did not like John the Baptist and really tricked Herod into killing, beheading John the Baptist. Um, but Herod here, he, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't like John the Baptist because remember Herod uh, you know, doesn't want to lose his power and he's afraid of thinking of John the Baptist as God that he's going to have this power. And, but it's same, so he's trying to keep his John the Baptist from exercising his power by putting him in prison, but he's also afraid of John the Baptist, so he doesn't want to kill him, but he ends up killing him anyway. But you see there in verse 20 what Herod thinks of John. It says, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy. So he considers it holy, you know, just like God is holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Uh, the modern translations really uh, change this verse around and change it to mean something that it's not doesn't mean, but really what it says when he heard him, he did many things. Basically, it's saying that Herod observed John the Baptist, and when John the Baptist needed something like food or something to drink or had a request for something, uh, Herod brought it right to him or made sure he got what he asked for because of his fear of John. So this is the kind of reaction that people are going to have toward the disciples and thinking of them as God and fearing them instead of, and what they should do is the disciples then have to be very careful to point not to themselves, not to take any glory for themselves, but to point others to, to God the Father themselves. And in fact, that's what their ministry is. When they do these miracles, these physical miracles, they preach the gospel of the kingdom and so they are pointing, they're saying, you know, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And it's God who brings that remission of sins, and that's not the disciples, even though the disciples will see in John chapter 20 where it talks about that uh, Jesus even gives them the power on earth to forgive sins because they have the Holy Ghost with them. And so it would be easy for them to get the big head, basically. And so it's really this demonstration here of inserting John the Baptist's death and the events surrounded them 
in verses 14 through 29 is to demonstrate to disciples how people are going to think of them as God and maybe even try to worship them or to give them the credit, whereas the disciples need to be humble and continue to just trust in what God has told them and to be that servant working, preaching that gospel of the kingdom and not just doing flashy miracles for show, but rather to demonstrate that their message is true and that their message of repent and be baptized for their mission of sins is the most important thing so that people will be saved and enter into God's kingdom so that the Israel will become a kingdom of priests. And so that's the reason for this parenthetical reference here. And so then we pick up in verse 30, as I read earlier, the apostles, they gather themselves to basically give a report unto Jesus of the things they had done. And so that he moves on from there. He has them in verse 31. He said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. So there's a lot of people around. You can see already this is the first time that Jesus has sent the 12 apostles out, and you already have crowds around them. And so they have to go to this desert place just to get rid away from the crowds. And that's what happens with Jesus. They did not follow him because they believed he was... Israel did not follow him, I should say, because they believed he was the Messiah or the Son of God. They followed him because of the physical miracles he was doing. If someone had was uh, a leper, then they hear of Jesus. Well, they come. They don't come to get um, their sins forgiven. They come to be healed of leprosy. Or if someone had, you know, the issue of blood, like that woman, well, she came to have her blood healed, not really a spiritual healing. And so, when these apostles they do these things, uh, people follow them and think of them as God, like Herod did with John the Baptist. And and so. Jesus basically has to set him aside after this first journey, if you will, to the cities of Israel and to show them, you know, basically get them set apart in a desert place and to show them how that he is God and that he's the, basically he's the Messiah and that he is God and that God the Father, they should be pointing the people to God the Father through the gospel of the kingdom and that even though they have the power to forgive sins, they will, after the Holy Ghost has come upon them, it is still uh, God the Father, ultimately, who cleanses them of their sins. And so, you see them coming into a desert place. And so, now Jesus is going to teach them some things. Because even though the disciples have believed the gospel of the kingdom, which is repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and they have been sent out to do those things, to preach that, and to do the signs of the kingdom, they still are largely in unbelief, in the sense that they are still believing the traditions of the fathers, the things that the Jews have taught them, rather than the things that Jesus is teaching. And so now Jesus is in an effort to edify them and bring them into an understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom and the things that they can rely on in the tribulation period, relying on God to get them through that, um, that will edify them and enable them to endure until the end of the tribulation period. So that's what we see next here. You see in verse 33, the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. So you've got this great um, crowd of people. Uh, verse 34, Jesus is moved with compassion because they are like a sheep without a shepherd. And so then he began to teach them many things. Um, verse 35, when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. So you see that the disciples, they're not learning everything that Jesus has taught them. Because if you hold your place and go over to Matthew chapter 7, I believe it is, um, the Sermon on the Mount, as it's popularly called, is not in the Gospel of Mark. But they have been taught this well before the time when they were sent out and before the time of, of uh, the Mark chapter 6 here, where you have all these people that are hungry. They need some food, and the disciples say, so send them out to go buy food. Well, Jesus had already told them, and look at Matthew chapter 7. He said there in verse 7, Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. Uh, one of the main things that Jesus is referring to here is being able to feed 
the little flock during the tribulation period. The last three and a half years of the tribulation period, they will not be able to buy or sell any food because they did not take the mark of the beast. So they have to rely upon others to give them food. For the most part, they do end up fasting and voluntarily, you know, going without food. And so Jesus is teaching them that they should ask of the Father to provide them food. Because there he continues in verse 9. Matthew 7 verse 9 it says, Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? So the examples are food, bread and fish. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Uh, so the idea here is, you know, ask the Father. So he's already taught them this. Well, here's their chance to rely, have faith in God's word, have faith in what the Lord Jesus Christ has already taught them in the sense that you've got 5,000 men around them who need food. But instead of trusting in what Jesus has already taught them, they are, because they are still caught up in the religion that they've been, that they grew up in, that the Jewish religious leaders taught, when these people are hungry, they say, well, we need to just send them away for them to buy food. And that's why Jesus' reaction, if you go back to Mark 6, verse 37, when they said that, Jesus answered and said unto them, Well, give ye them to eat. So in other words, he's saying, I already taught you how to get the food. You just ask and it should be given unto you. And so he said, you know, give ye them to eat. But their response, again, a lack of faith. They say unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? So basically now Jesus has to feed them because of the lack of faith of the disciples. So you have the, uh, there are five loaves and two fishes there. And so he has them sit down and, uh, and he takes the, in verse 41, it says, When he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. So he has them, he has the disciples distribute, and it really shows the proper order of God's kingdom on earth. It's Jesus as the king over all, and then the twelve disciples, they're going to be sitting on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then under them, of course, there are going to be the twelve tribes, and under them will be the Gentiles. And so this is the proper setting, Jesus above, then the twelve disciples beneath, distributing to Israel. Um, their main focus in God's kingdom is going to be the spiritual distribution, of course, of you know the truth of God's word. But here it's a physical distribution to demonstrate, you know, that they can rely upon God to feed them physically during the tribulation period. And so they distribute, the disciples distribute. In fact, if you hold your place and go to Acts chapter 4, we can see this already starting to develop after the Holy Ghost came because they're building trying to build that kingdom of priests, make Israel to be a kingdom of priests, so that the tribulation period can start, since the kingdom of God is at hand. And over in Acts chapter 4, you see this sort of already happening. Now, over in Luke chapter 12, I believe it is, Jesus says to the little flock that they are to sell all they have. And part of that is because once that great tribulation period starts, which is halfway through the seven-year tribulation period, they will not be able to, uh, all their goods, their possessions, everything will be of no value because they will, it will be taken away from them. They will not be able to participate in the economic system of the Antichrist since they do not take the mark of the beast. So as a result, they might as well sell and then distribute among those to meet the, of the little flock to uh, meet the needs of them. And you already see this happening in Acts chapter 4. Uh, it says there in verse 34, Acts 4, 34, it says, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man as according as he had need. So if you go back to Mark chapter 6, that's sort of what you're seeing here. The food given to the disciples, because they they would have, it, it, if it's in the tribulation period, they would have asked of God, They've been given the food, and now they're distributing it to members of the little flock. So that's the basically the truth that Jesus is trying to teach or demonstrate to the disciples here. And you notice there in verse 42 of Mark chapter 6, where it says, They did all eat and were filled. So they're filling. That should remind you of Matthew chapter 5. Again, this is a physical demonstration, really, and it physically happened, but it's also a physical demonstration of a spiritual truth. 
And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, with one of the things called the Beatitudes, Jesus says there, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So those who will repent and be baptized, they believe the gospel of the kingdom, they follow God's law of covenant, they preach the gospel of the kingdom throughout the tribulation period, they are going to be filled with righteousness in God's kingdom. Well, that's a sign of what we have here in Mark chapter 6, where they did all eat in verse 42, and were filled. So they're filled physically by God's provision, but also if they hunger and thirst, not after bread and water, but after righteousness, then they are going to be filled spiritually in God's kingdom on earth. Uh, verse 43, they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And so that's a reference to you know, 12 baskets being a sign of the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's a reference to the apostles feeding all 12 tribes of Israel or all the members of the little flock during that tribulation period. And verse 44 tells you they did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. So Jesus gives this demonstration, physical demonstration, to teach the disciples to trust in, and the little flock to trust in God's provision during the tribulation period and that they will be filled spiritually both in the tribulation period and uh, subsequently in God's kingdom on earth for all eternity. So that's what he teaches in there. And then the next thing he's going to teach then is uh, about how he is the Son of God. And that's in verse 45 where it says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. Uh, so he sends away the people. Notice uh, verse 47, it says, When even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. So Jesus is up on a mountain. He's praying. Now even has come. The tribulation period is signified in the Bible by the night. And then you have the ending of that tribulation period is considered the morning. You know, not M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, but the morning as opposed to the night. M-O-R-N-I-N-G. And if we look, you can see that in, I wanted to get a reference here in the book of Psalms. Uh, Psalm chapter 30. If you look at Psalm chapter 30, verse 5. basically a verse that demonstrates that. Psalm chapter 30 verse 5 says, For his anger endureth but a moment. So that's referring to the tribulation period. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. So they're weeping, they're mourning in the tribulation period because of the suffering, the tribulations that they're going through. And it endures for that night time, that night, the seven year period of the tribulation period. But then, when the tribulation is over, then joy comes in the morning because that's when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, his second coming, to destroy the wicked, to get rid of the Antichrist and the false prophet, throw them in the lake of fire, throw Satan in the bottomless pit, and start God's kingdom on earth. And so this is what uh, Jesus is giving them a picture of that here in the book of Mark, chapter 6. So he waits until even was come and the ship in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land, showing how during the tribulation period, although God does not forsake his people because Satan's kingdom is strong through the Antichrist during that time, it will appear by looking at outward circumstances that God has abandoned them. Where is God? He's turned his back away from them. Now, God will still be with them in God's word. And like the book of Proverbs, there's a lot of wisdom there. And if they trust in the wisdom of the Proverbs versus the wisdom of the Antichrist or the mystery Babylon, I should say, the Babylonian religious system of the Antichrist, if they trust in the wisdom of God, trust in God's word instead, then they will endure through the tribulation period. And so this is sort of like a test here uh, in verse Mark chapter 6, verse 47. The ship being in the midst of the sea, God doesn't seem to be around. The sea is often a reference to sin, Satan being, that's his realm basically in the sea. And, and so it's like they're in the midst of sin all around them in the tribulation period. And uh, see what they will do. Will they trust in God's word? Uh, you see there that because of their unbelief, they do not trust in God's word. And so in verse 48, He saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, He cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. 
So the fourth watch of the night is the last watch of the night. It's just before dawn. So there's that picture again. Uh, you know, the weeping enduring for a night, the tribulation period, but joy comes in the morning. So right there at dawn, all right, just before dawn, the Lord Jesus Christ shows up on the scene, uh, reference to uh, his second coming. And so uh, they see him walking. They think he's a spirit, so they're, they're scared. And in verse 50, uh, for they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So Jesus arrives right on time at the end of the night, which is the end of the tribulation period. Verse 51, he went up with them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. So they think, you know, who is this? That Basically, um, they're... The parallel passage in the book of Matthew, if you hold your place, go to Matthew chapter 14. It gives you a little more information. And when there was a previous time that we studied last week where Jesus... There was a previous time last week that we studied where Jesus uh, was in the ship. He was asleep in the ship. Water came up and they came to him and said, you know, save us, we perish. And then he calms the wind and the sea and they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? So they still saw him as a man. Well, this time when he does this, they finally see him as God. Uh, Matthew tells us that. If you look over at Matthew chapter 14, uh, verse... 32 Matthew 14 verse 32 it says and when they were coming to the ship the wind ceased then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him saying of a truth thou art the son of God and that's a picture of how the the little flock in Israel or how Israel the saved members of Israel I should say are going to respond to Jesus at the when he comes back second coming to the end of the tribulation period they'll say truly thou art the son of God at Finally, they will see that. But Jesus is trying to get his little flock to see it right up front because they're going to have to be the believer. They're going to have to be the leaders going through the tribulation period, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They're going to have to believe in him as the Messiah and as the Son of God in order to continue to endure until the end. And so you see there in Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 6, um, that when he comes in there, and that, so now they see him as the Son of God, as Matthew tells us. Uh, but you notice in verse 51, it said they were sore amazed in themselves. Uh, verse 52 tells you the reason. It says, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So even though Jesus is showing them these, uh, showing the little flock there, trying to build them up into the mysteries of the kingdom to help them endure the tribulation period, you still have the hardness of the hearts of even the believers. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's bad enough that the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders, have rejected him, and that the multitudes just come to him for some physical miracles. But the ones who actually believe the gospel of the kingdom, his twelve apostles that he's called out, uh, they still, they don't get beyond that because they have the hard hearts, and the reason is because of religion being so ingrained in them. But again, Jesus is just trying to show them. And they are learning a little bit anyway, because at first, they, when he first did this, calming the wind and the waves, they thought he was a man. Well, now they see, uh, as Matthew tells us, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So they are, they are growing up, but at the same time, uh, they were still amazed that, this, that he was able to do this. He had already done it once, but yet they're amazed he does it again. Um, but at least they're learning from it. So they are you know, getting bits and pieces here. And so then you have, uh, when, they get, when they get on to land here in verse 53 through 57, you see he's going to heal more people. Verse 55 says, They ran through the whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. So they're following Jesus around, and even though he gets in a boat and they can't follow him on a boat, uh, they were actually running uh, beside the sea, just running on land, uh, trying to keep up with him. And so they make it to the other side about the same time he does sees where he is and they bring people there. It doesn't say that it doesn't say that they came so that they could 
enter into God's kingdom so that they could get out of being Satan's lawful captive because Jesus came to bind the strong man and to deliver the captives. It doesn't say that they've come to him for spiritual healing for eternal life. It says they, they were there for physical healing. Uh, verse 56, Whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were but the border of his garment and as many as touched him were made whole so we see religion is just it's got a stronghold here uh, we talked about that last week with the woman with the issue of blood who says well if i just touch the hem of his garment i'll be healed and so jesus tracked her down and basically says no 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 it's not your religious observance it's not your good work that brings you healing he says daughter thy faith hath made thee whole it's faith that's now now, I should back up and say, these people are in unbelief, and a lot of these miracles um, Jesus does, it's not, they don't have to have faith in order to be healed physically. That's important because people will bring that into today's dispensation, and they'll pray for God to bring a physical healing, and then they'll say, when it doesn't happen, they'll say, well, you just didn't have faith enough for, it to be, for them to be healed. Uh, when it comes to physical healings, that's not the issue. Faith isn't the issue. The physical healings in, were just something that Jesus brought along to demonstrate that the message that he taught of repent and be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is at hand was valid, that he was from God, and that in order to enter, the, it was just a, basically the miracles are just a means to an end to get the people to believe the gospel of the kingdom so that they may enter the kingdom. Um, Jesus really is not, and God really is not concerned with the physical well-being of somebody. If they are, say, a like that woman with the issue of blood, let's say she dies 20 years before she normally would. Well, if Jesus heals her, and uh, now she gets to live an extra 20 years, well, that's no big deal in the scope of things uh, compared to all eternity. Um, 20 years is nothing. So really, God isn't concerned if someone just lives a short life uh, that's really of no concern to God. He doesn't care if someone dies early. I know that may sound harsh, but really God's concern is of eternity. His whole goal, purpose, is to reconcile. It's, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-4 through 4 says that God's will is for all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And so if you're saved, then he's gonna spend, you're going to spend all eternity with God. And so if you live only 20 years on this life, instead of a hundred years or you live you know just a few short days on this life you die as an infant instead of living a hundred years that's really of no concern to God what what concerns him is does he get to spend all eternity with you and he wants he desires for all men to be saved so that they can spend eternity with him so these physical healings are just really a demonstration of the power that God has given Jesus and so that they may be saved and enter into God's kingdom. That's the whole purpose here. They, but where faith is an issue, it's not an issue with the physical healings, but where faith is an issue is with being able to enter into God's kingdom. Because without faith, as Hebrews chapter 11 says, it is impossible to please God. That refers to all dispensations. It's, it refers to faith in what God has said. Today he says, trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's the way to eternal life. Back then, in the gospel of the kingdom, God says it's faith in the gospel of the kingdom, which is repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and endure unto the end. So whatever it is, it's a faith issue, and that's as far as spiritually speaking. But the physical healings have nothing to do with faith, but rather it's, it's to get them to a place of faith in God so that they may enter God's kingdom. Uh, but you see here that they're not, they don't have the belief and they are trusting in themselves, not in God, and that they're wanting to touch his garment in order to be physically healed. And so Jesus is going to demonstrate now as we get to chapter 7 about how, how contrary that religious system is to God's law. You see there in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Notice verse 3, and this is probably the most important passage in the book of Mark as far as the other Gospels do not cover it. Uh, and so, you know, if you're looking for a unique passage in Mark, 
uh, this is a good one to go to because it demonstrates more clearly than any of the other gospel accounts how steeped the religious leaders were in the tradition of the fathers and not obeying or teaching God's laws. You see there in verse 3 it says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. So it doesn't say this is God's law. God's law did not say you have to wash your hands before you eat. This is just a tradition that the elders had taught. Verse 4, And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold. So in other words, just more traditions of the elders. They've built upon that that are not of God. And it gives the example there as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Verse 5, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. If you look at that passage, we really don't have time to go into it, but that is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40, um, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. And the context, uh, I'd encourage you to just read the, pass, the verses around that, because the context of Isaiah 29, and if the Pharisees were, knew God's word, um, read it and taught it regularly, if they knew that, then they would know what that passage means that he quotes. Uh, basically, it's saying that uh, in Isaiah chapter 29, that the religious leaders will not be able to understand God's word, and the reason being, and that the little flock will be the new religious leaders, and the reason being is because they are trusting in the tradition of the elders and not in God's word. So really, when Jesus quotes this here, um, you know, the Isaiah's prophecy here, he's really sh showing them yet again that the Pharisees are going to replace, be replaced as Jewish religious leaders and that new re leaders are going to take over and they're not even going to make it, the, the religious leaders here, the Pharisees are not even going to make it into God's eternal kingdom on earth. And so it's just a warning to them. Basically, you know, if you went back and read Isaiah chapter 29, you would understand that because you're holding on to these traditions and not following God's word, God's law to you, then you're not going to be saved. And it's not the outward appearance that's important, it's the inward heart. They have been trusting in their Jewish heritage. They think, well, we be of Abraham, we're okay. But Jesus taught them, no, you're of, you're of your father, the devil, as he says in John chapter 8, because of who they are on the inside, not what they are on the outside. If you look over, hold your place and go over to Matthew chapter 23, um, the indictment that he gives of the scribes and Pharisees, if you look down in verse 25, Matthew 23, 25, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So that's their goal here. Basically, everybody has a conscience within them, and they would feel guilty for disobeying God's law and that conscience written upon their hearts. And to appease their conscience, what they did is they created a religious system, the tradition of the elders, so that they could do things like uh, kill the Messiah or you know, commit adultery. Uh, John chapter 8 tells of this woman caught in adultery. That was a, a religious leader who was uh, having adultery, um, sexual relations with this, with this woman. Uh, you know, they did all kinds of sins. They stole from the poor with their, you know, bribing judges to uh, get land that wasn't theirs. Uh, they did all kinds of injustices and evil things, but yet... Uh, they appear, what they could do is, if they followed their religion, if they did things that appeared to men to be okay, like washing cups, washing their hands, well, then they appear to be good in the sight of men. They ease their own guilty consciences by thinking, okay, we're okay, and then they can just continue doing, feeding the flesh, doing whatever they want, and appearing to be righteous. And so that's, 
uh, you know, the idea here, and that's what Jesus is teaching with the, when we go back to Mark chapter 7 and those Pharisees, they are saying, well, you know, why are your disciples eating with unwashed hands? And basically Jesus is saying, that's not what's important. Um, verse 7 there, Mark 7, verse 7, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And ye said, and he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Verse 13 says, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. So they've cast aside God's word. They're not going to make it into God's kingdom. And uh, it's really just to look good in the eyes of men. And God's saying, really given a contrast to show because the disciples, they're in a state of unbelief. They're trusting in religion. And he needs to demonstrate to the disciples that what the Pharisees are teaching should be abandoned. They should jettison everything that those religious leaders are saying as long as what they're teaching is the tradition of the fathers because it's going to make the commandments of God of none effect. So if they end up trusting, continuing to trust in religion, those disciples, they're not going to be able to endure until the end through the tribulation period because they will just follow that religion that the Antichrist is just going to pick up and they will follow that. It seems good. He's doing sacrifices in the temple and it seem, and it'll seem good and so then they'll take that up. But And so Jesus has to demonstrate to them to abandon that and trust solely in God's word. And if Jesus is teaching them something, and it, of course he's going to teach them God's word, and if it's contrary to what they have been taught, the religion has taught them, they need to abandon religion and trust in God. So far, they've done just the opposite. And so Jesus is teaching them, you know, here through this example here. And uh, you can see that they, you know, they hold those traditions of the fathers here. They make the word of God of none effect. And uh, then he teaches, Jesus says there in verse 15, he says, There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats? And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of, man, of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now it's important to understand what Jesus is saying here because verse 19, all the new, all translations except the King James Version and the New King James, but the New King James will include it in a footnote. And so really all the translations other than King James in verse 19 add a parenthetical phrase saying that by Jesus' teaching, what they say here is that Jesus taught that all foods are clean. And it's important to understand that's not what he's teaching. Because if you go over to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So he's, come, he's not getting rid of the law. The law says certain foods are unclean. And if Jesus taught that foods, all foods are clean, then Jesus is getting rid of the law. And he said there in Matthew 5, 17, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. Verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, of course, is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the ruler in the kingdom of heaven. Now if Jesus was teaching 
in Mark chapter 7, as all translations indicate, except for the King James Version, if he was teaching that all foods are clean, that he's teaching contrary to the law, he's teaching men to disobey the law, and that would make him least in the kingdom. But he can't be least in the kingdom. He's greatest in the kingdom. If he was doing this, then he would not be God. And so all modern translation, just on this point alone, should be rejected because they really teach, by adding that parenthetical phrase, they teach that Jesus is not God, that he's disobeying his own rule here or disobeying the law here by saying, oh, well, the law says certain foods are unclean, but not really. You know, I'm changing it to all foods are clean. Basically, that's what all your modern translations say, and they make Jesus then a lawbreaker, that he is not holy, he is not God. And so even though he went to the cross, he didn't die for your sins because he was unholy. He couldn't take on the sins of the world because he's just a rotten old sinner just like everybody else. If he was really teaching that all foods are clean. And so just be based on that fact alone, I mean there are hundreds of differences in these other translations, but just based on that fact alone, all translations should be rejected except the King James Version. Now you may say, well that's a little harsh, but it's the fact is, you have to have a holy God to redeem man, and you have to have a holy Bible without any errors or any contradictions in order for it to be of God. And if there is just one error in your Bible, then you just got to throw it out. You can't trust in it to be God's word because there could be other errors that you don't know about. Maybe someone really isn't saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe those are just errors that got in there. But thankfully, we have God's word. Psalm chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, God promised to preserve his word forever. And we know we have God's preserved word through the King James Version of the Bible. It's holy, it's without error, and we can trust it and believe it as God's word. It is the only holy Bible today in English. And so, but I wanted to go over you. Well, you'll say, well, these modern translations teach that Jesus declared all these foods to be clean. And if you look at the verses, it you could get that conclusion. Most people would get that conclusion. So then you think, well, what is he teaching? Well, what he's teaching, because he does say anything that you know, he says in verse 15, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. So it makes it sound like, well, any food that goes in the body doesn't defile that person. But really, he tells you what defiles a person is not what goes in the body, but what comes out of the body. And you see that in verse 20, he says, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries. And he goes on there. So he says, really, basically what he's saying is the sin is in the heart, and then it, and it's just the action that's behind that thought, evil thought, is just a demonstration of that sin. Uh, Jesus, if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus spends verses 21 through 48 of Matthew chapter 5 demonstrating that. How the Pharisees teach the tradition of the elders, but how that can be contrary to God's law. You just We don't have time to go over all of it, but if you look at just an uh, example here, uh, let's say uh, verse 27, Matthew 5 verse 27, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So the tradition of the elder says, well, you don't actually sin until you actually physically commit adultery. But Jesus says that's not what the law says. The law says that if you just look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. Why? Because out of the heart. Those are the things that defile a man. That's where those evil thoughts are. And so the sin is already done once you have that evil thought and it's in your heart saying, oh, I'm going to commit adultery with this woman. That, that's it. You've, you've done it. As far as the law is concerned, you've committed adultery with that woman. Physically speaking, you didn't do it. But you've broken the commandment of thou shalt not commit adultery if you do that. And so that's what Jesus is saying is that basically if you take the law of you cannot eat, say, a, a pig because it's cloven-footed. So that was part of the law there. It's an unclean animal. Well, if you have the evil thought that you are going to eat some bacon, then that is the sin right there. You have committed that sin. And so Jesus isn't saying, well, it's not that all foods are clean. He's just saying 
that the breaking of the law occurs in the heart. And so if the disciples were to eat something that was unclean, like eat some bacon, eating the bacon isn't the sin. It's the thought that came out of the heart that says, I'm going to eat that bacon. That's where they sinned. And so when, so when Jesus is saying that it's not something to enter into, so when you eat that bacon, it, that's not what defiled the man. You're defiled already because of the evilness in your heart. So that's what Jesus is teaching. He's not teaching that all foods are clean because it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. What he's teaching is that what defiles you is not obeying God's law. And that goes right along with the tradition of the fathers versus the commandments of God. And the demonstrations are there in, in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, verses 21 through 48. He says over and over, you know, it's been said of old time. Those are the traditions of the elders. But I say unto you, and he shows you that it's a heart matter. It's not the physical action of that sin. It's the heart matter of that evil thought that, that's in that heart. And the conclusion in Matthew 5, verse 20, he says, Your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And the conclusion in verse 48 of Matthew chapter 5 is, Be ye therefore perfect. Well, the obvious response is, no one's perfect. And that's true. That's why they have to believe the gospel of the kingdom, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Then when they get into the kingdom, God will place the new heart upon in them. That will be the new covenant. They will have God's spirit within them to cause them to walk in those statutes. And they will be perfect under the law at that time. But at this time, they are not. So basically, that's what Jesus is teaching in Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. He does not declare all foods clean, but rather he is teaching that what defiles a man is what's in the heart. And that's that evil thought. In this case, if it's an evil thought to eat a food unclean, that's the sin that where they broke the law of eating an unclean animal before they actually ever ate that unclean animal. So Jesus is teaching them, the disciples here, to abandon the traditions of the elders and to believe God's law and to believe, have faith in what God is teaching them. And now he gives an example of someone who does have faith who is a Gentile in verses 24 through 30 and it really goes to shame uh, Israel as a whole that you have this Gentile who understands what's going on. She comes to Jesus and uh, asks for him to heal her daughter and he says there in verse 27, this is Mark 7, verse 27, Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. So Jesus says, I've come, as he said in Matthew chapter 15, um, it's the parallel passage, we're not told this here, but uh, Matthew 15, he told her, I have not come but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so he's the children here, and verse 27 is referring to Israel. It's the Jews. And the dogs are referring to the Gentiles. And basically Jesus is saying this is the proper order. Is that the Jews must be saved first. And so these physical miracles are to get them toward believing the gospel of the kingdom. For them to be saved, they become a kingdom of priests. And then they go to the Gentiles for them to be saved. And so the miracles will come to the Gentiles in the millennial kingdom. But it will... But not now, basically. The time for these miracles are not yet. Right now, it's for Jews to be saved, and these physical miracles are assigned to them. But notice her reaction, verse 28. She answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. So she realizes the proper order. And it's the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Jesus, uh, God says that those who bless Israel, I will bless. Those who curse Israel, I will curse. And so it's just that proper order. And that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through Israel. And so all those nations of the earth come through you know, Israel being saved first. But yet she recognizes that, that she, being a dog, uh, would eat after the children. But yet she can partake in there. Uh, Jesus is proclaimed in the book of Luke to be a light unto the Gentiles, fulfilling a prophecy in the book of Isaiah. And it's not that the Gentiles could not be saved because God loved everybody and they could be saved by blessing Israel at this time. And so basically because Jesus sees this woman's faith, she understands the system. She understands the order. <coughs> it says there in verse 29, He said unto her, For this saying, so because she says this, Go thy way. The devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. 
So this Gentile stands in stark contrast to the, to the Jews. You had the Pharisees at the beginning of the chapter steeped in their traditions. They're not obeying uh, the Lord. They're not uh, believing God's word, believing the gospel of the kingdom. And then you have the, the disciples. They're trusting, they're trusting in these traditions as well. But yet here's a Gentile woman. She doesn't have the law. She's on the wrong side of the law of partition. She's in darkness, but yet in her darkness she felt for the Lord and she understood the program and she understood the Abrahamic covenant. And she's just, you know, even though she's in darkness, she doesn't have the light of God's word. She understands more than the people of Israel who have the light of God's word to, to uh, lead them along. And so it stands there in contrast there. And now then in verse 31, we're going to see a demonstration of a person who is uh, like the nation of Israel at this time. Verse 32, it says, They bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. So you have this uh, deaf person. They, he doesn't have the ears to hear. We saw that back in verse 16. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. The nation of Israel does not have the ears to hear. They are in unbelief. They have hardened hearts. They have, they have deaf ears, just like this deaf man here. Spiritually speaking, they are not believing the gospel of the kingdom. But yet, God has the power to go ahead and heal them. But notice there in verse 33, it says, And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. So this seems a little odd. He hadn't, we haven't been told of him doing this before. I believe this is in response to what we've seen already three different occasions in the book of Mark where people have the... Um, the idea and the multitudes come to him thinking well if I just touch the hem of his garment I will be healed they think this is a work that they have to do in order to be healed and I think Jesus is making the point here is that really it's a that the physical miracles are just a sign of the gospel of the kingdom and that to be healed spiritually which is the ultimate end to these physical miracles the reason for these physical miracles they have to have faith in order to enter into God's kingdom and so it's not a work they can do. So I think Jesus is basically saying, well, here's, here, I'm going to do the work for you. Now stop touching me. Stop trying to get healed through touching me. Stop trying to do a work. I'll do the work for you. And so if you think you have to be touched, well, then I'll do it. I'll put my fingers in the guy's ears. I'll spit on him and I'll touch his tongue. Uh, you know, that should cover everything. You know, what, what else do you want me to do? You know, you want me to, you know, rub my hand over his shoulder or, you know, you know yeah, or, or, or give them a high five, or you know, <laughs> what do I need to do here? Uh, you know, I'll do it. In other words, to get them out of the work, to think that, oh, this is something I've done that caused this healing. And Jesus is basically saying, no, it's God's work that's doing this healing. It's nothing that you've done. And so he demonstrates this by doing work for them so they won't do anything. Verse 35, straightway his ears were open, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged him that they should tell no man. But the more he charged him, so much the more a great deal they published him. And were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. These are just signs. He wanted to open the eyes of the blind and open the ears of the deaf so that they have the spiritual hearing and the spiritual sight to see what God is doing so that they believe the gospel of the kingdom, uh, understand the mysteries of the kingdom, get through the tribulation period, endure until the end. And so that's a sign there. And even though they've rejected him and Jesus is concentrating his ministry on the little flock, they still have an opportunity to be healed, which will be through the ministry of the Holy Ghost after he comes at, at um, the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. So now, uh, chapter 8, Jesus has, is going to give the disciples yet another opportunity to trust the doctrine that he has taught them. He gave them the opportunity, we went over it before, to feed the 5,000. They wouldn't do it. They were trusting in religion. And Jesus is already in Mark chapter 7 now. He's shown how religion should not be trusted. Rather, you should be trusting in the commandments of God. He shows a Gentile woman who has faith and believes what God's word says. And she's healed as a result. You have this deaf mute um, healed here uh, to demonstrate what he could do. God can do spiritually. So now, let's see if the disciples have learned anything since the the, heal, the uh, feeding of the 5,000. Now they have the opportunity to feed 4,000. Verse 1 of chapter 8. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them. So basically, you know, he's saying, okay, they've, you know, they've been with us if you... Uh, 
they've been with us for a while here. Uh, verse 2. So basically he tells, he calls his disciples and he says, Okay, you know, we got a problem here. We've got this great multitude. It's about 4,000 people. They've been following me around. They, don't have, they haven't eaten anything for three days. So what do you think we should do about that? You know, in other words, giving them an opportunity to apply what they've learned. Verse 2, Jesus said unto his disciples, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. For diver, divers of them came from far. So many of them came from far. They haven't eaten for three days. And, you know, Jesus could have just taken loaves and fish and distributed them just like he did the 5,000. But he's given the disciples a chance. He's come to the disciples. You know, we've got this problem. What do we do about this? You know, basically Jesus is saying, I'm not going to be with you in the tribulation period. Remember, you were in the midst of the sea there. I wasn't there. You, uh, you know, what are you going to do in the tribulation period? So he gives them this chance. Verse 4, you can see the disciples are still in religion. They are in unbelief. They believe the gospel of the kingdom, but they do not believe. They're not trusting in God's provision to get them through the tribulation period because their response in verse 4, his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? So Jesus has to feed them again. So Jesus commands them to sit down. He gets the bread and the fish. He feeds them. Um, and But you notice there in verse 9, it says, They that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Uh, so what we're told here, they followed him for three days without eating. That's very admirable of them. But the multitudes are in unbelief because they, they do not believe the gospel of the kingdom. If they did, they would follow Jesus here instead of just uh, going away here. They would go ahead and follow him like the 12 apostles are doing, but they don't even believe the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, so chapter 8, really the theme of chapter 8 is you see a lot of frustration. You see the apostate condition of the nation of Israel. So you see the multitudes, the common people here in verses 1 through 9, who they do not trust in Jesus in order to enter into God's kingdom. They just follow him for the physical miracles. And once they get this they feeding of the food, then they, they leave. They don't stick around. They're not following him in order to enter the gospel and, and enter God's kingdom. Next, we see the Pharisees in verse 10 uh, through uh, verse 13. You see them asking for a sign. Verse 11 says the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. Now, they've had all kinds of signs. Uh, this isn't something that they need. In fact, we'll see in chapter 3, if we go back to chapter 3, verse 6, we were told way back there, uh, in verse 6 of chapter 3 of the book of Mark, it says, The Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. So when we get to Mark chapter 8, they're not, they have no intention whatsoever to believe in Jesus to repent, be baptized for the mission of sins, to enter God's kingdom. They, they have no concern with that. They just think, this guy is getting the multitudes following him. We want to destroy Jesus so that we can maintain the power over the people, continue to get their money, continue to get them to follow us. They don't care about following God and the king. They're of the devil. They just want their own benefit. And so they, so they come to him to tempt him, to ask for a sign. They've already been given plenty of signs. So Jesus says there in verse 12, why doth this, he said, sighed deeply in his spirit, and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. Well, this generation is the generation of vipers, those who are of the devil. And since they are not going to be saved anyway, because they've already rejected Jesus as their Messiah, claiming that the signs he does are of the devil's power, why would he then give them a sign? In Matthew chapter 12, it went over that, how he heals this man, casts out the devil, heals the sick there. And the Pharisees say, well, he does it. And the multitudes say, well, is not this the son of David? Isn't this our Messiah? The king is going to sit on the throne forever? Isn't this the one we've been waiting for? And the Pharisees say, well, he does this 
by the power of the devil. And as a result, the Pharisees get the people to go away from Jesus, not believe him. They believe the Pharisees instead, and they're not going to enter the kingdom as a result. So why would Jesus give the generation of vipers a sign? If he gave them a sign, they would just say this again. Oh, he does this of the devil and get more people to stray away from believing the gospel of the kingdom. So he just won't, he won't even give them a sign. So he just leaves. You know, in verse 10, he had come... So Jesus just leaves. In verse 10, he had come and said, Straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Dalmath, Dalmanutha. And then right away the Pharisees come forth. They question him. And so he says, Well, no one's going to get saved here. They're so steeped in religion. I've got this. Uh, the Pharisees have rejected. They've got, they got control of these people. So he gets back into the ship. Verse 13, He left them and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. So you had in verses 1 through 9, you had the multitudes, most of Israel, rejecting, not believing the gospel of the kingdom. Now in verses 10 through 13, you see the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders, they're not believing the gospel of the kingdom. They're not following God. They're staying in their religion. And now you see in verses 14 through 21 that the disciples, again, are still steeped in religion. They are in unbelief. As far as believing the mysteries of the kingdom, believing what Jesus taught them, believing the law of God over the tradition of the fathers, believing in the things that will get them through the tribulation period to endure to the end, uh, they're in unbelief because in verse 14, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Leaven in the Bible is a type of sin. So what Jesus is telling them is basically the bread is the word of God, you know, the bread of life. John chapter 6 covers that. And so the word of God is what is going to sustain them through the tribulation period spiritually to endure unto the end. And during that time, because they are steeped, the disciples are still steeped in religion, Jesus basically gives them a warning saying, beware of the leaven or the sin of the Pharisees, because what they do is they take that bread, they take God's word, they throw leaven into it, sin, and uh, by and as a result, they get rid of God's word, God's law. They make it of none effect, and the tradition of the fathers replaces it. So that now, if the disciples are trusting in religion, trusting what the Pharisees say, then they are going to fall into sin. They're not going to endure until the end. They'll end up taking the mark of the beast. They'll end up following the Antichrist because that will be the Babylonian religious system during the tribulation period. They will follow that rather than following God's word and the commandments of God. And so. That's what Jesus is trying to tell them. But look at their reaction. They don't get this. Verse 16, they reason among themselves saying, well, this is because we have no bread. Again, they, they haven't gotten it. Bread, why is Jesus, why would Jesus be concerned with bread? He just, he fed 5,000 people with bread. He fed 4,000 people with bread. Bread is of no concern. He could just do what he told them in Matthew 7. Ask it, it shall be given unto you. Your father is going to give you bread if you ask for bread. He's not going to give you a stone. He'll give you fish if you ask for fish. He's not going to give you a serpent. He'll give you what you need when you ask for it. And so why then, and they've already given the demonstrations of that, feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000, all the miracles that have taken place. And they're still in the religion saying, well, he says this because we have no bread. And so Jesus, verse 17, you can see the anguish in his spirit here. You know, Jesus, he's, you know, his patience is tried. You know, can't you guys get it through your thick skulls here? You know, verse 17, when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand? Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? And do ye not remember when I break the five loaves among five thousand? How many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They said unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? So you can see Jesus is trying to build up the little flock to be able to go through the tribulation period, edify them in the truth of God's word, mysteries of the kingdom. Endured to the end through the tribulation period, and they still just, they're not getting it. <coughs> they're looking at the physical aspects around them because they're walking by sight, not by faith. 
and uh, they're steeped in religion. And so now we have a miracle here. And it really demonstrates here in verses 22 through 26, the healing of the blind man to demonstrate that really Israel is not going to be a kingdom of priests and the nation as a whole is not going to be saved until Jesus' second coming. That's the, the point of this, pair, of this uh, healing, uh, this physical healing of this blind man uh, because they, the nation just isn't getting it. We already saw the multitudes re they're just going for physical miracles. The Jewish religious leaders, they've rejected him. Uh, the, the disciples, they're not, even though they're the only ones who believe the gospel of the kingdom, and they're not being edified because they just don't understand. They don't have the ears to hear, the eyes to see. They have hard hearts. And so the nation, sadly, they're not going to, they're not going to, the nation as a whole is not going to accept Jesus as, they're not going to believe the gospel of the kingdom until his second coming. Verse 22, he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. So he goes out of the town as a symbol of the fact that, you know, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 13, I think it says, where you have to, he says, let us go to Jesus without the camp. In other words, they have to go, uh, it's Hebrews 13, verses 11 through 14, which demonstrate that. Jesus, uh, the, the camp is full of religion. We've already seen that. The nation of Israel steeped in their religion. The only way to be saved is to go outside of the religious system and to believe the gospel of the kingdom, trust in God's word in order to be saved. Uh, we saw that with John the Baptist, how he was in the wilderness. People had to go outside of Judea, Jerusalem. They had to go outside of that religious system, go out to a desert place in order to repent and be baptized, confess their sins, to join the little flock uh, in order to go into the kingdom. So too then, this blind man, that's why he takes him out of the town. He could have killed the blind man in the town. It's no big deal. But he takes him out of the town so that he will, it's a demonstration of how if you're going to be saved, if you're going to make it into the kingdom, you've got to get outside of that religious system, go without the camp, as Hebrews 13 verses 11 through 14 talk about, in order to believe the gospel of the kingdom, endure unto the end through the tribulation to be saved. So he takes him out of the town. Uh, verse 23, it says, And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. So again, Jesus does the work, so people don't think it's something that they have to do. He spits on his eyes, um, puts his hands upon him, asked him if he saw aught. Verse 24, And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. So this is a sign of Jesus' first coming. The blind man stands for the nation of Israel as a whole. And some of them will see. Some of them will have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and some of them will be saved. That's the little flock. But just like just it's just a partial seeing, the nation as a whole won't see. Nation as a whole won't say, truly thou art the Son of God, and uh, believe in Jesus Christ, uh, and believe the gospel of the kingdom until Jesus' second coming. So then verse 25, after that he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. So that's a demonstration of Jesus' second coming to him. And that's when the nation as a whole sees clearly they are saved. So now verse 27, Jesus is trying to uh, basically in verses 27 through 29, uh, it explains it basically a little bit further this demonstration here. Uh, verse 27, Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others, one of the prophets. So this is a representation of Jesus' first coming. At his first coming, they do not see him as the Messiah, as the Son of God. They just see him as another prophet, just like John or Elijah. At his second coming, they will see him as the Son of God, as the Messiah. And that's what Peter's answer in verse 29 demonstrates. And he saith unto to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth, and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And the book of Matthew adds that he also says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so that, that's a demonstration here of that, just like the story of the healing of the blind man, the first coming. They just think Jesus is the prophet. It's not until the second coming they recognize him as the Christ, as the Messiah. Uh, so Jesus is uh, showing them basically what the healing of the blind man is all about by him asking the disciples this question. But notice verse 30 is interesting. He charged them that they should tell no man of him. 
and really, well, what are they not to tell? Well, the, what they're not to tell then is what they already know in verse 29, thou art the Christ. So they're not to tell that he is the Messiah. Now, verse 31, it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and he rejected, uh, be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. So a couple of points to mention here. Uh, first off, it says in verse 31, He began to teach them. So this is the first time that Jesus has ever mentioned to them of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. They had not known this before. And in verse 29, we're told that you know, they said that thou art the Messiah, the Christ. And he says in verse 30, tell no man of this. So basically, Jesus is saying, don't tell any man that I am the Messiah. And in verse 31, he says, I'm going to die, be buried, and raised from the dead three days later. So he had not told them of this before. So two, about approximately two years before he began to teach them of this, they went out preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Well, if they went out preaching the gospel of the kingdom and they did not know that Jesus would die, be buried, and raised again, right, be risen again, and they did not tell people that he is the Messiah because he says, uh, you know, don't tell anybody about this. Well, then the gospel of the kingdom has to be different from the gospel of the grace of God, which is today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 tell us that the gospel is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins. But yet, uh, the disciples didn't even know about this. You see him in verse 32, it says, He spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. So Peter says, basically, if Peter was preaching the gospel, of, if the gospel of the kingdom was to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins, Peter would have said, well, we already know this. Why are you telling us this? Or if, or if he didn't say that, he certainly wouldn't rebuke Jesus because he says, well, yeah, that's what we've been teaching everybody all along. But he did not know this because verse 31 says he began to teach them this. And the gospel, so the gospel of the kingdom is not the same as the gospel today. It's a different gospel. It's a different good news because they're two different programs. The gospel of the kingdom is to, for Israel to be saved so that they could be a kingdom of priests to, for the Gentiles to be saved so God can reconcile the earth back to himself. Whereas the gospel for today is so that God can reconcile the heavenly places back to himself through the body of Christ. Two different gospels. And I wanted to... Uh, show you uh, if you if you hold your place there and go over to the book of Luke. Uh, Luke chapter nine is where Jesus had sent them out two years earlier than where we are here in Mark chapter eight. Uh, Luke chapter nine verse two says he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And we're told there in verse 6, Luke 9, verse 6, And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So the gospel, they've been preaching the gospel. The gospel is the kingdom of God. And what the gospel is, is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. It, if they were, they were preaching this gospel two years before they even found out that Jesus would die, be buried and raised from the dead and they didn't even preach that Jesus was the Messiah because Jesus charged them don't tell anybody about this but rather they were preaching repent be baptized for their mission of sins clearly a different gospel from what we are told today in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 to trust in Jesus death burial and resurrection as atonement for sins so now going back to Mark chapter 8 uh, verse 31 he finally began to teach them of what he's going to suffer and then he uh, demonstrates to, in verses 34 through 38 about how they need to uh, basically follow him. Verse 34 of Mark chapter 8, When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So there are four things there to do. Uh, to come after him would be basically to believe the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, denying himself if they were to come after Christ, believe that gospel of the king, deny themselves then would basically deny themselves of the material possessions and the positions of power that the Antichrist would offer them in the tribulation period. Apostate Israel is going to be 
following the Antichrist, and a lot of Israel will follow him because of those material possessions that he will offer them and the positions of powers, but they need to deny themselves. Taking up his cross means forsaking the religion of the Jewish religious leaders, something that the disciples desperately needed to do. And so that cross of religion, set aside that cross of religion and take up uh, Jesus Christ's cross instead, trusting in God's provision rather than your own provision, your own righteousness, the self-righteousness of religion is, is their own cross. Jesus Christ's cross is the imputed righteousness that comes from believing the gospel of the kingdom. And then finally, follow me is the fourth thing that they are to do, which would be to preach the gospel of the kingdom uh, during that uh, tribulation period. You know, follow what Jesus did, what he sent the 12 apostles to do, which was to heal the sick, cast out devils as two signs of the kingdom, preach the gospel of the kingdom, which is not Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, or that he is the Christ, but it's repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And so that would be the way they follow him so that others may be saved. And you can see the, the explanation that I've given of these four things. You can see this demonstrated if you continue in verse 35. It says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. So those who would, you know, if you want to save your physical life, you'd have to take the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast uh, because... In fact, let's go over, if you hold your place, go over to Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> we could see that there in verse 15, Revelation 13, 15. It says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And so if you don't worship the image of the beast, you're going to be killed. So that's, but then in Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 9, it says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. <clears throat> so basically, everybody in the tribulation period has a death sentence. Those who do not worship the image of the beast has a capital punishment, physical death, proclaimed by the Antichrist. Those who do worship the image of the beast has eternal death proclaimed by the Lord. And so those are the two deaths that Jesus is referring to in Mark 8, verse 35, whosoever will save his life, don't uh, those who worship the beast, well, they're going to lose it eternally. But whosoever shall lose his life, in other words, be willing to be killed, not deny Christ, not worship the image of the beast, that whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So that's those material possessions that they that the Antichrist is going to offer Israel. They need to instead deny themselves in order to enter into the kingdom instead of gaining the whole world and lose their own soul. Verse 37, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, this generation of vipers, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So basically, in summary of chapter 8, you have the multitudes forsaking, not believing, the Pharisees not believing, the disciples who believe the gospel of the kingdom, they don't believe anything else. And Jesus is telling them, basically, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Don't believe the religion of the Pharisees and of the Jewish religious leaders, but trust in me. And that's the only way you're going to save your life. In, a, in other words, enter into eternal life in the kingdom. And so now we're going to uh, change.